Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and welcome to Lathe Space Program. Yes, that planet in the background is not, in fact, Corbin. That is Lathe, which is a moon around Jewel. And in many ways, it is similar to Corbin. It has an oxygen-rich atmosphere, which enables you to have uh, aircraft and things like that. Uh, it is about roughly the same mass. It has slightly less gr surface gravity, slightly thinner atmosphere. But other than that, everything pretty matches up. But what is different, of course, is the mint near to the space station or whatever, near, near to this planet. Let's actually just come out, go to the, go to our tracking station. You can zoom out and see, yes, we are indeed orbiting Jewel, of course. And, uh, well, we can, of course, start a space program and grow it up through the traditional career mode. We can build our spacecraft, we can, uh, you know, escape orbit, eventually escape the sphere of influence and perhaps visit Val, or if we're really crazy, go to Tylo, and perhaps in some distant future we will be able to make the long voyage out to Kerbin, or Bin in this case. Now this is actually part of three different mods, Duna Space Program and EVE space program. For those of you who think that getting off Kerbin is far too easy, you can start out on EVE. Oh, look at that, that's beautiful. That is, of course, using the new Scatterer shader mod, which has vastly improved atmospheric shaders. So yeah, we, it's just like a standard oh, space program. Look, we can gather scientific data from Lathe, which is a, a whole lot easier than it is regularly. We and of course, our, our first own, mission our is to launch a spacecraft. Launch our first spacecraft. So yeah, I put this thing together, and sure enough, this... Oh, look at that. That's Jewel in the background, of course. Sitting forever over the launch site, because uh, Lath is in a uh, tidally locked orbit. Which means Jewel always appears to be the same in the same place in the sky. I mean, literally in the same place, because the eccentricity is zero and the inclination is zero, so it doesn't even librate. Just checking out the cameras that I put on this, because I don't know why. I was messing around, wasn't I? I mean, you know, isn't that what you do when you find that your space program has suddenly moved to the moon of the largest gas giant in the star system? There we go, look. Looking down here, we should be able to get a little higher on this, because uh, Lathe's gravity is slightly lower and its atmosphere is slightly thinner, but more or less most of the aircraft that work on Lay on uh, Kerbin should in fact work on Lathe also. Uh, the only difference is that there's a lot more sea to land on, so seaplanes make a lot more sense. Uh, incidentally, as I pan the camera around you might notice some glitching at the, the coasts. That appears to be something to do with Scatter. I'm not sure if it's because I'm running this in OpenGL mode or something like that, or if it's just to be expected with, you know, in, it's the price you pay for those beautiful Scatterer shadings of the planet. So yeah, Lathe space program, you can build out an entire space program, it's totally legit, but it is but one of three options. The truly hardcore might want to instead start on EVE. EVE with its very thick atmosphere, its very high gravity. And you'd find that quite a few of the rockets actually have a real hard time lifting off simply because their uh, thrust to weight ratio at launch is insufficient. Furthermore, the thick atmosphere of EVE will actually reduce the thrust of many of your favourite rockets. Now, I've just, I just played a little bit of a career mode, I thought, oh, let's, you know, just get into orbit. Like, no, that wasn't going to happen, I went and messed things up. But I was very lucky in that I got an experimental test contract for this particular large solid rocket booster, so I've kept that around with the idea that I would be able to test it, fly it, and perhaps use that to get myself a little closer to orbit. But because of some contract glitches, I wasn't, I maxed out my contract list and therefore wasn't able to unlock, uh, get any more money. So I started to resort to some very um, interesting designs. Yes, lacking radial decouplers means that I did things like this. Very entertaining, I'm sure, very scientific, but not exactly effective at the job for which they were intended. Of course, if at first you don't succeed, Fly, fly! Well, okay, that didn't work too well either. I'm gonna beat this thing, I tell you. So I pulled a Goddard and decided to put the thrust in front of the spacecraft, thereby making the whole thing a little more stable. We, it also lets me unlock, or sorry, uncap 
that a uh, rocket engine, the one, the vectoring capable rocket engine, so it can actually provide some level of control and keep this thing going fast. Keep this thing going straight and fast and high. We're just going to go really, really, uh, well, basically upwards. And then once we reach the critical altitude, what we can do is ditch the front of the spacecraft. And then, of course, we'll do that just before the solid rockets burn out so that it goes and flies away. That's, that's the plan. Of course, that's the plan. Does the plan work? Let's find out. No. For some reason, the decoupler absolutely refused to decouple. So at least until some of the bugs are fixed in the system, I thought, let's at least just try to get to orbit. And this is what I came up with. So we have a bottom stage there, which is, uh, well, it's basically a little, you know, one of those vectoring engines, an LV-45, and then we have a couple of solid rocket boosters. So the, the little engine in the middle is primarily to provide directional control because those solid rocket boosters don't have any directional control unlike many real solid rocket motors used on real launch vehicles. For example, the Space Shuttle solid rocket engines, they actually had a hydraulically actuated nozzle so they could get thrust vectoring. But uh, say the Titan 3C, it had a different approach. Its uh, first stage, or sorry, stage zero, had a couple of solid rocket motors and to steer those, they actually injected, I think it was nitrogen tetroxide, they injected that and that in increased the combustion on one side and caused the thing to turn. Anyway, this design is barely able to accelerate after those solid rocket motors are ditched. But as the mass drops, it starts to rise faster and faster. We are going to space. I'm pretty sure we're going to space. So there are some glitches in this right now. The atmosphere curves, I think, might be right, but the atmosphere, at least graphically, cuts off instantly at about 70 kilometers. I'm not sure how high I actually have to get to be considered to have departed the atmosphere, so I'm just going to go on and presume that this is a proper Evian atmosphere, which means 85 kilometers. I don't think we're getting into orbit. Actually, what am I saying? I know we're not getting into orbit because I spent too much time losing power, uh, losing delta V to gravity losses. We're going to get a decent amount of speed in orbit here, we might even burn up on re-entry here. Uh, initially, we have ditched this and our velocity, our vertical speed is increasing. Actually, no, our vertical speed is decreasing, but our horizontal speed is increasing faster, so our actual velocity is increasing. The question is, will we be able to get up to 85 kilometers? Or will we just be able to get a glimpse of the curvature of Eve and prove those naysayers wrong? No doubt with its thick refractive atmosphere, if you take measurements of the optical measurements of the curvature of the planet near the surface, it may look flat. In fact, with that level of refraction, it might even look like it's bowl-shaped. I always find it amusing when flat earthers come out and say, but what about the Bedford Lake experiments? They showed the Earth to be flat. Actually, a lot of people did those experiments. Some of them showed it to be curved, and some of them showed it to be curved negatively. So you can't just cherry pick one result and then base your entire philosophy around that. That's like throwing a dart at a dartboard, hitting the bullseye and then saying all darts thrown at a dartboard will hit the bullseye. Anyway, I uh, just gotta say I am using Scatterer right now when I installed this mod and due to an unfortunate interaction it is using Kerbin style shaders for EVE which means this is completely wrong looking although it does still look completely cool. The way most of the multi-planet mods work is they essentially remap existing planets to other planets so you know they will take those parameters and this causes all sorts of problems with mod interactions and in this case I think Kerbin is being substituted for EVE so the scatterer thinks it's working on Kerbin, whereas the rendering thinks it's working on Eve, and it's all very interesting. But hey, look, we're coming down in the ocean, and I haven't, you may not or may not have seen this, but, you know, scatterer has done an amazing job on its ocean shaders. It does, I believe it's what's called vector shaders, where they basically take the, the vectors that define the edges, edges of the mesh, and they can distort those according to shader functions. Shaders is basically how graphics programming all works. You basically can operate on pixels or points or vectors or all sorts of weird stuff. But that's why the ocean looks so darn pretty, although 
it doesn't look like the ocean is supposed to look like on EVE. So for that reason, I thought I would step away quickly and just show you what Ocean is supposed to look like on EVE using a completely unrelated mission to the uh, the Evian space program. Yes, with Scatterer set up properly, you get a nice green ocean and pink skies, and in this case, a probe that lands in the water without realize well, without being able to deploy its parachute because I was dumb. Because I had activated it through staging and then deactivated it, and then that meant that the staging was broken, so it meant the probe crashed into the ground. Uh, but anyway, look at that fabulous ocean. Doesn't that make you want Scatterer? Okay, finally, from the same creator as the Lathian space program and the Evian space program, we have the Dunian space program. Again, the shaders for the sky are not correct because Scatterer thinks it's on... Carbon when in fact it's on Dune. Duna, sorry, not Dune. We do not have giant worms. Has actually anybody made a giant worm mod for Kerbal Space Program? Because it would seem highly appropriate. I'd love to try taking a giant worm and making it move over the surface of Duna. Anyway, yeah, I thought, what should we try doing? We'll try flying a plane. And of course, the atmosphere on Duna is incredibly, incredibly thin. So... We're using a nuclear thruster here, because of course we can't use jet engines, the jet engines don't work. The nuclear thrusters do, and they just use nuclear fuel, but they don't generate very much thrust, but hopefully this will be enough to get me into the air. Uh, to be fair, with a wingspan this wide, and a, an aircraft this heavy, and an atmosphere this thin, it is the aerial equivalent of the Titanic. It will not be able to exactly turn on a dime. In fact, I'm not even sure. Yeah, I am actually gaining altitude here. Look at that! A successful liftoff by Jebediah Kerman in a new generation of Dunian e aviation. So yes, if you've had enough of Kerbal Space Program and want to try your space program based on other planets, the mods are all from Gregor X Moon. Uh, you can install them using CCAN and they obviously change the challenges a lot. Especially when you consider Duna, for example, trying to land that first mission on a parachute isn't always going to be particularly successful and getting off EVE can be really hard and landing on things around, uh, the, a lot, around Jewel well, that's a whole set of challenges in and of itself. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.